Yeah, so yeah, as already mentioned, my name is Lucas Hertmann. I'm a master's student at the University of Copenhagen's Nada. I'm going to present a paper. It's called uh, Linguistic Architecture, like Interconnected Linguistic Architecture. And uh, I want to go over a few aspects of this. First of all, what linguistic architecture actually is. Uh, what uh, is the benefit of it? Uh, first of all, a little bit about how it differs from different architecture and uh, how you can make it more, use, more, more useful for uh, a developer like actually making a good, good, good way of uh, modeling. So first of all, I'm going to show you an example if I can. Yeah, so uh, what you see here, uh, I have um, some examples here of what uh, we're dealing with. And uh, you can see here we have technologies, for example. Uh, this is um, Redux, then on the other side there's uh, concepts like a uh, visitor pattern or uh, model relationships like um, you see here is uh, uh, a meta model and a model in it and uh, different language usage or, uh, for example you see here uh, you open the file of different uh, programming languages but also how different programming languages interrelate uh, for example, this last one, the last, last example down here, it's uh, how you call JavaScript or how you uh, execute JavaScript in Java using a scripting engine. And uh, this is all, um, this all, uh, all uh, stuff that is concerned with like linguistics of uh, a software system. And uh, by linguistic, linguistics, we mean what languages, what technologies, and the concepts are used. And uh, this differs from uh, other models of uh, or other versions of variants of architecture. Um, for example, if you think about architecture in the sense of packages or in the sense of classes, this is something completely different. And um, just how do we model this? Uh, it's uh, very simple. What we do is basically an entity relationship uh, model. And what we have here are bindings and also modularization. You can see this. Uh, these are the sorts of statements we deal with. Like uh, top here, you have a definition of a new type and entity type, which is language, which is derived from set. Then you have uh, relationships between entities or entity types, uh, have an offer example, and uh, definition of artifacts or entities, which are in this case uh, Java as a language. And uh, below that, you have the relationship between two entities, which uh, in this case is files and the language uh, of, of Java. And the lowest one is uh, how you actually connect the entity relationship model to the system that you're modeling, and this is the binding. It basically, it just says uh, that the entity is bound to an artifact. And uh, for, uh, for this, we use uh, a URI implementation, but it actually it's not really URI, it's a sort of URI. Okay. Uh, the question that we're trying to answer, as already mentioned, is uh, how can we help uh, people create and understand systems linguistically? and uh, how to perform mega modeling. And we try to answer these questions by uh, finding uh, common problems and uh, common problems of mega modeling in the sense of linguistic arch architecture. And uh, how, uh, the, the second question, question, we sort of answer this by giving the developer an IDE. So uh, why do we want linguistic architecture? Um, there's uh, many uses, uh, I've put up some of them. Uh, the first, of, uh, first of the, the, the main reason, as you already mentioned, is uh, uh, documentation. So that we have uh, cognitive, cognitive value in a good, structured, documented way. But uh, also, um, what's uh, not only here is that um, if you have um, the, the, cog the cognitive value and have it represented as a linguistic model, you uh, also have. Um, uh, uh, you can actually, uh, if, you, if you have a proper way of executing or uh, how to, uh, of, of checking relationships, uh, it, it also makes uh, the model more and more, more strong because you don't just say something, you, just don't, you don't say that the file uh, uses this, par uh, this paradigm or is it written in language, you actually give a way of um, properly checking that this is true. That's what we're doing. Um, so let me continue a little bit on uh, how modeling is done here, in our sense. Uh, what we have on the left side is the mega model, which is the, the linguistic model. On the right side is the system that we are actually modeling. And there are some relationships that you see between this. So what we have here is instantiation, alignment, verification, abstraction. 
And we also have the, the, the big arrows around it, which is prescriptive and descriptive mode. And uh, there's two arrows starting up, uh, up here, which is forward, and uh, forward engineering and reverse engineering. And also a property just, just holds on mega model, which is to perform this. Uh, what do we mean by instantiation? So take, for example, you have uh, a model where you give a linguistic, arch, a, a linguistic fact, where you say, uh, for example, that you have a file that is elemental language. Instead, instantiation in this case would be that you actually create the file in the system that you're modeling. So this is, uh, for example, you don't have the file before, you just uh, say that there will be a file with uh, these properties. Like, for example, it is elemental this language, it uses these concepts, it refers to these, these libraries, etc. Then there's uh, the alignment, which is basically uh, changes on the other side. If you uh, model the, uh, model them uh, like, uh, next to each other, the, the systems, like the mega model and uh, the system itself, then you need to align them. So you need uh, a way of uh, finding some uh, of uncovering new elements in the system. But also, uh, if properties don't hold anymore, that you get ways of, of reinstating the properties or uh, having to remove the properties, for example. Uh, verification, it's a very important part of uh, our system, is that uh, if you have facts, as already said, that you can actually check them. So that we have, for example, if there's a language element of a statement, or a file element of a language statement, that you actually give a way of checking this. You probably would you use an acceptor or a parser and check if there's no error or if the acceptor says, yeah, okay, this is true. But for other, for, uh, other relationships, that might, might be a little bit difficult. Like, for example, if you have a referral of a technology or a library, for example, you say you have a Java file that, that uses a specific parsing library or a specific uh, deserialization library, and you need a way of, of uh, actually checking this. Like if you state that file refers to, uh, for example, sex, a sex parser, uh, then you probably want to find uh, some evidence of that, that this is actually true. So, um, you yeah, know, I have an example of this later. <coughs> and the last one, this one is abstraction, which is basically the other way around from uh, the instantiation, is that you see a system and you get, get uh, tools that help you to um, create the proper abstraction in the sense of uh, linguistic architecture. Uh, yeah, it's just the other way around from the instantiation. Uh, prescriptive mode, descriptive mode, this is basically the way where you start from uh, the system that you reverse engineer the, the, the mega model, or when you have these uh, prescriptive modeling that you say, yeah, we have uh, the model as the first element, and from the model itself, we uh, create the system. Okay. For all these uh, things, these are not, not quite trivial, especially verification, because there's uh, different relationships, and uh, the, the, the language and the technologies are quite diverse, and uh, this, this you can't just uh, make a solution that fits everything. You have to have it very open and uh, very pluggable. So uh, here are some challenges that we're trying to tackle. Uh, and um, by, by the developers, uh, we try to make, uh, give the developer good support for uh, creating and uh, editing and viewing these models. And uh, we try to give them the support for these, these features. For example, automatic abstraction of, uh, of an observed system so that you say, if you have a sort of a pattern that some uh, facts follow, they can auto automatically uncover them instead of uh, having developers uh, pulling everything from the model by themselves. Or uh, instant uh, exp exploration of uh, transient and random entities. I'll, I'll come to that later. It's uh, also a very interesting part because software, what, how we see it, how we see it, it does not all. Or, uh, does not always deal with artifacts that are manifest on the hard drive. Because in some cases, you want to talk about something that just is there as a state while the software runs. Yes. Okay. So, uh, what we've, uh, we came up with is aspects of linguistic architecture. And uh, this is some uh, sort of observations that we have throughout the years because we've been developing the language uh, behind this uh, talk and behind this uh, paper uh, for some time now. And uh, these aspects are what we find, uh, found to be uh, 
to, to, to be very, uh, very important for creating software <coughs> creating a system, a linguistic architecture that's very useful. And uh, I have uh, given all the eight aspects here. I don't have the time to talk about all the aspects, sadly. But I'll uh, go to the, the aspects that are uh, most prominent in related work, some sort of meaning prominent in related work, and not really covered at all, or just barely covered. And the first one, I already hinted at this before, is uh, the plug pluggable analysis. Because uh, I already mentioned this, that you have um, diverse technologies and diverse languages, and uh, you can't, at the point where you try to release the, the, the software or the modeling framework, have everything covered. Like there will be new languages and there will be new technologies and new libraries. And you can't check this uh, all like from the start, like for, from when you release it. So you need to have it very open. And uh, therefore we uh, encourage plug analysis. And uh, what we do here is that we um, make a model verification on the base of the entities and the relationships that are stated. Uh, we could also do this on the entity types and relationship types themselves, like if you want to have um, to check the type system itself with uh, plugins, you could do this, but we have not yet found the use in the, the case studies that we have done. And um, what we do here is that we have uh, defined, we, def we define the, the verification as a check from an element to report, and this uh, check can also see the entire model. I, I didn't mention this here, but I should have. Um, this report, uh, this gives you, this, this is uh, the result of the verification and can say that if, if the model element is valid or if this is an error, there's also a little bit of finer granularity between it, like you can have an information uh, report and also a warning report, which is basically mapped to the IDE because we want to give uh, uh, people who try to create this analysis the option of uh, uh, giving very precise and very detailed uh, information to the modeler if they use the relationship and the plugins. So, how's this structured? Because uh, uh, I already mentioned this, that uh, we're targeting the relationships and the entities, but what we have here is the plugins. So we have plug analysis, so we also have plugins. And these plugins, they are attached to the relationship types and the entity types. And all the instances of the relationship types and all the instances of the entity types are fed into the plugins so that they can check if the statements are true or uh, give some proper error messages and responses. But since we, uh, we sort of needed a way of configuring these plugins, uh, we figured out that we can also say that these plugins themselves are entities. So what we do here is that we model the linguistic arch architecture and also include the evaluation of the, of the model itself in the linguistic architecture. This helps, uh, this helps us make uh, this, this plugin analysis reusable and also to, to properly con configure the plugins with stuff that's relevant to them. This is the next one here. Because uh, since they are entities in the model themselves, you can also connect them with the, the same relationship types that you, that you have for the other entities. And I'll show the example here. Uh, again, this is the element of evaluator, and the element of evaluator is defined to be a plugin, and this is basically uh, responsible for all the element of relationships. Uh, we have a second one. This is the artifact element of language evaluator. This is a little bit, a bit troublesome. This is a little bit too long. In still, you can see here that this is plugged into the element of evaluation, and we say that this uh, evaluator because um, we mainly use parsing here to check it. It also refers to the, the concept of parsing. So we specify parsing, this is not, this is not given here uh, uh, as an entity, but this would be an entity like parsing is the concept, and as I already mentioned, we will have a, a semantic annotation where we actually point to a resource that properly describes what we mean by parsing. Then, for example, here we have the language Java. We want to make uh, the element of test for Java. We say here, this is a Java acceptor, which is a plugin. We link it to the class that actually does the acceptor. And uh, we say that this is a part of uh, the, the element of evaluation. 
and combine it to the language itself. So here we have uh, realization of Java. So what we can do with this is that we have um, the Java acceptor and it's actually bound to connect itself. And if you want to see, if, if you for example have um, a tool that lists you all the relationships that Java is, in, uh, is, is, is um, connected in, you would probably see, you would also see that it's connected to this evaluator. And uh, this also helps with this patching. For example, if you have uh, the element of relationship, you can check the, the type or, the, or the, the language that's on the right side and just uh, choose the appropriate acceptor because we can, we can basically just map from Java to the, the class that accepts the, the, the file. An actual example of this here, it's also in the paper, you can see the XML confirms the XSD and we, have, we extend it from the class and we let it return the report. So with an optional uh, the type that can uh, supply it with, like for, for tags or for annotations. And we get the relationship element and basically we can do whatever we want with this. And also in the evaluation where you plug with analysis, what you would do is that you take the binding, so the actual artifact that is on the system, and uh, read it in some way. This is uh, also part of the paper. Um, down here is the, configura uh, the configuration. What we have here is it conforms to evaluator and also the binding it conforms to evaluator. And uh, the relationship, this, uh, this time this is uh, a different notation where the relationship itself is in relation with uh, the plugin itself. And also the, the simple, uh, simple XML API. Uh, this is how it uh, would actually look like if we execute this in the IE. You see that we have the file here, an XML file. And what I've given the, the, the binding is uh, bound to a file that's actually not con uh, conforming to the XSD, to the, the schema. And what you get here is that you have uh, the error message from the element, from, from the evaluation and plugin, that uh, would be fed back into the editor as an error. And what you can see here is that the instance doesn't confirm the schema, reason, and you get the exception. And basically, this is how I can do pretty easy uh, feedback on uh, the language report. The next thing I kind of want to talk about is the binding of artifacts, because it's also pretty important. Uh, what we found is that uh, you don't just want to talk about uh, artifacts like in whole, like just the file, but there's also sometimes uh, interesting things within files that you want to talk about that are sort of harder to locate and harder to address with regular your eyes. But first of all, how do we do this? Generally, uh, we link uh, via UIs. Like sort of UIs is a little bit, a little bit more to them than just UIs. Uh, like, for example, we allow like stopping at one point, like resolving UI, and at one point uh, giving the resolution up to the, the next plugin. Like you say, uh, you navigate to a file, show this the next part better. Navigate to a file, but then again, then, then you start navigating in HTML, and in the HTML you navigate by selecting characters, for example. And uh, this here is an example of this because uh, it's also the first one where I showed the, the Java where you execute uh, JavaScript in, the, in, in, in Java itself. Um, this, uh, for example, if you want to talk about this, if you want to say uh, you use this, this NASA library uh, to execute this code and you want to talk about this, the precise location where you use it, uh, you need a way of, of getting there and just pointing to the file and to the line. It's very unstable because you will get uh, files that move around, like someone edits something above it and now the lines don't match up anymore. Uh, so you want to have some sort of strong mechanism uh, of, of, of how to address this. And this is what we've been using so far. Uh, it's also subject to more research. This is going to change a little bit. What we can see here is that if you want to talk about the fact that you have this here, which is a jQuery segment, I think, in JavaScript, in an HTML file, then you need uh, three layers of actually digging into a file. And uh, yeah, this is, this is what we support by, by our uh, plugins. Uh, it's also a plugin structure is similar to, um, to the one we have for uh, res resolving entities, but it's a little, a little bit more ad hoc. This is also still, still very, very useful. And also, if you don't have this, you can't really, can't really talk about uh, locations like this. The different variation you have here is actually if you actually have a parser, but this is also this will also be covered by the next paper. 
So the last thing that I don't uh, think is covered very well is the transient artifacts. As I already mentioned, is that if you have software that features um, a large database or something, some transactions, or uh, for example, um, uh, response, HTTP response, something you don't really see as a file. And um, what you want to have here, if you want to talk about this, is the method of dealing with transient artifacts. We found that there's some ways of dealing with transient artifacts. Uh, for example, you could do debugging, breakpoints, and touch points. Uh, you could modify, you could try to uh, to get to the value without modifying the code. For example, with ASCII version of programming, but you can also modify the code. And for the case studies that we've done so far, is that we just make the code more accessible and uh, try to find, uh, try to make a method that just gives gives us the result. There's 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 a lot of ways of actually getting to the transient artifacts. And uh, what we, for example, I will mention this right now, is yeah, a function that actually deser deserializes uh, an XML file, and we just bind it by giving it a URI, deploying it. So after the execution, or after the model is uh, evaluated, or during the model, like model evaluation even, uh, this method up here <coughs> will be called, and then this object graph entity will be bound to uh, an object that is actually not represented on the hard drive. It's not manifested. This deserialization method basically has an accessibility method that helps us get into the, the runtime state. So uh, I want to go over how we uh, evaluated this just a little bit. Uh, what we try to find is papers that actually do mega modeling in the sense that we do, and try to find the aspects and how they were handling this. And I want to mention this, the artifact binding. You see it's 3.1. Is uh, covered very well among <coughs> almost everything. Like uh, the, the smaller dots are not covered as much. The bigger dots are uh, covered pretty well. Uh, black hole analysis, you see, it's, it's it's a little bit less. On the on the, the rightmost side, transit artifacts, you see, is uh, not really covered at all. Sadly, but we try to fix this. Uh, the output, what we're going to do is uh, we'll try to make more models like more linguistic architecture to, to, to find out if these as aspects are enough, if these are sufficient. Um, try to find more plugins, or create more plugins, also make creating plugins more easy. Uh, the resolution, like I said that we have dispatch, but for example, this dispatch is just on one, 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 uh, on one position, but if we need dispatch on more positions or more complex queries, how we can uh, resolve the plugins is also an issue. Uh, traceability links, we're also working on this. Uh, like making them uh, more easy to, to generate, give a, a broader plugin base to actually get them without doing a lot yourself if you model them. And yeah, the last one is the URI, the URI replacement where you have comp uh, compositional and meta model based addresses. Like instead of having the URI that's not a URI anymore because it doesn't conform to a standard, we just have um, something that's actually a composed set of URIs with operators between them. Yeah, that's them. Talk now. <laughs> Some questions? I asked on the Google Slides thing. Uh, do you have a more fine grained tool for these error reports? Or is any error report just an error report? Error report? Are you talking about the reports from the plugins? Yes. Uh, basically, just in a uh, list of uh, annotations and their type, and this gets resolved by the IDE. So uh, the, the, the plugin, the, the, the art architecture itself, allows you to return anything you actually want. But if you want to interfer, uh, it, it, be able to interface with the IDE, you get some some, some special uh, results, like they're mapped to uh, the, cor the corresponding Eclipse locations. Right, so basically this is an X text based yeah. domain specific modeling language for mega models and these reports basically are mirrored into squiggles and, and, yeah. and the warnings and errors and the controls and uh, into the providing links. So, um, 
how do you how, how do you manage or at least the process of uh, refining the information uh, within the within the repositories and so on. So there is there is information in it and then analysis which will refine the information and will extract new information from what is all already in the repository or establish new relationships. Uh, yeah, the, the models are, in that sense, the models are uh, explicitly given by yourself and some of the, the facts can actually be inferred by, by model inference. I don't know if you're talking about this. Uh, and analysis, uh, you, 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 what we don't do right now is that we store the reports or like, we don't have an actual measure of, uh, of how good they are, we're working on that. Uh, but, um, if you add a new uh, analysis, uh, then the model will get re-evaluated. And you'll get new errors. Basically, what we focus is like on, on the on the process of uh, modeling a system, and uh, the the developer gets direct feedback, and he can write the the, the, the relationship, and he, direct, he gets a message that this one is not evaluated yet. That should, he should provide evaluation methods for it. Or if he changes the file, then the entire system gets re-evaluated, re and then you get an error. For example, if he doesn't have it, if, if the system is not right anymore. We can also think about like having this uh, continuously integrated and like getting uh, evaluate an evolution of uh, the error reports. With this. So what, what, what's really interesting, and Lucas hinted at that, is how to be sure that you have a useful documentation. I mean, obviously, we try to compete with existing informal documentation, documentation, or we try to also add something to stack overflow, right? So we have technical papers or we have other forms of <laughs> informal uh, documentation. This is supposed to be more executable, more systematic, you know, more structured documentation. But of course, we have to ultimately prove that it's good documentation, that it covers the technology, that it covers the scenarios of using the technology. And that's where we struggle. I mean, uh, that's going to be very interesting. And I mean, that the other thing is really how to make it easy enough, because at this point still it's very painful, it requires lots of thinking to write this documentation, and lots of thinking. So, so it's basically not yet ready for mainstream, uh, that's still the best in research, how to get semantically rich, verifiable uh, documentation. Another question? Okay, then I propose to, uh, let's close the session here. Uh, thanks once again all of the speakers of this session and uh, okay, next is the social event. Yeah.